Okay, this is what the first snowfall looks like. Now, actually, this is the day after. Would have thought it had been all melted by now, but it hasn't. But you can imagine what it looked like when it first came down. It's not on the trees right now. It looked really pretty. Yes, snow is very pretty, but then you have to deal with it. You have to shovel it. You have to drive in it. You have to walk in it. And it's not that much fun. But the first snowfall is always very pretty. Good morning everybody and it's Steven here for Bland Designs and today is my weekly vlog and it is vlog number 44 and it's Monday November the 13th 2017 got my coffee okay <clears throat> so as you saw in the opening teaser um, I showed you some snow and I've got a, another little video that I'm going to insert later on in today's vlog to show you what the first snowfall here in uh, where we live looks like and we were on the vlog or on live last night Stephen and Walter live and we talked a little bit about the first snowfall as well and how magical it is and how glad we're see it see it gone <coughs> because it means we don't have to shovel it and drive in it and freeze in it and everything else that goes with it <coughs> I suppose if you're a winter sports person if you like skiing and stuff like that you welcome it but I am not one of those people so anyways, moving on. What have I got to show you as far as projects this week are concerned? Well, let's see. I did, and I have a video about this, and I've linked the video down below. I did this Christmas canvas. Trying to get it all into the shot here for you. So it's just made up with odds and ends of things that I had in my bucket of uh, Christmas items. I sort out my uh, papers and embellishments and things sometimes by theme and so I've got a couple for actually I have three big plastic cases filled with stuff for Christmas and so this was my effort at that and this kind of killed two birds with one stone because what I did with it is I took a picture of it put it into my word processor and created some Christmas cards now I don't send out a lot of Christmas cards why it's too expensive um it costs a buck a shot here in canada to mail something by snail mail so and there's no discount for sending out a whole bunch of stuff at once um they used to give you a discount on the stamps for christmas but they don't do that anymore so um it's a buck a card basically now i do think if you buy no don't think you do i think if you buy t uh, a book of 10 stamps is still 10 bucks um something like that anyways it's just become way too expensive and let's face it <clears throat> people throw out their christmas cards after christmas you know you you spend a lot of money buying box cards or whatever or you spend a lot of time and effort making homemade cards um and a lot of them i hope not the homemade ones but a lot of them end up in the garbage at the end I used to save them for years and years, um, thinking there was something I could do with them, you know. Um, I eventually just threw them out. I never got around to doing anything with them. I tried to make an album out of them. I tried to do uh, cut them up and use them as collage pieces. And, you know, not really. I still couldn't keep ahead of the game. So they went in the garbage. Not the homemade ones. If someone took the time and the effort to make me a card, then I kept those. Um, and they're in a place of honor. Um, and I would hope that people would do that with cards that people spend a lot of time and thought making. And at the at how much it costs to make a card and the time and the effort you put into it, really, I hope you're giving those cards to people who appreciate that kind of thing. If it's somebody I know who doesn't care about handmade products or really isn't into the crafting or art community, <clears throat> I will just send them a botan card. But I made these cards, um, mostly for family. And so at the front is basically the picture of the canvas. And on the inside, I just did a simple little cutout. I put a little distress oxide ink around the edges and I did this with my Cricut maker and the pens, had it do the writing. So I made about eight of these. I might make a few more. Um, there's not many people I'll be sending these to. 
what I do now actually at Christmas, and this may seem a little tacky and cheesy, but it's the modern age and everybody knows me, I embrace technology. So if it's coming from me, I would assume they would believe that um, I had put thought into it because of my love of technology. I do electronic cards. I'll make a, a little card kind of a thing digitally that I can send out to everybody you know, on my email list. And okay, sure, it's not as nice as getting something in the mail, but it's cheaper and it has thought put into it because I still made it, okay? I'm just taking advantage of technology for rapid and cheap communication. So anyways, that's how I do Christmas cards. Christmas, bah, humbug. <clears throat> Don't get me going on that. Okay, um, I also was working on some Christmas napkins. Now, we were out on the weekend and I went to Fabricland, a fabric store, and they had all, of course, their Christmas uh, material out. And I found this material that I really liked. And so I bought it. Now, it wasn't really particularly cheap, but the material's not cheap. It was $22 a meter. I bought a meter and a half, but a real surprise was that uh, it was on sale, 40% off. So that was bonus. And I brought them home and I used my Cricut Maker to cut out my squares. And then I used my serger and I surged all around the edges of it. I had to buy some red and green thread. So you can't really see the green, but the green is on a little thin line of green down here and then the loopers over the top. And the beauty of this material is it's almost like it's been printed on both sides. This is actually probably one of the bottom layers of this, but it looks nice on both sides. So that's a bonus. And I'm always looking for material like this when I make napkins because I don't want a plain uh, bare side. So I made 10 of these little cocktail napkins. Now, these didn't start out to, my plan was not to make cocktail na napkins. My plan was to make regular dinner napkins. Um, and I started cutting the first couple and I realized I had cut them way too small um, for that. I think these work out to being about 10 inches square. Really a dinner napkin, I measured some are about 17 or 18 inches square. So um, I still have some of this material left, but not enough to make, um, well, I'd like to make about another 10. So I think I'm going to buy another meter and a half, maybe two meters of this material. I, I'm debating whether I'll get exactly the same one or not. I think I will. I really like this one. It would all go together nicely since we'll be having Christmas dinner this year here. Um, so tomorrow I'll go out and I'll get uh, another couple of meters of this and I'll make uh, regular dinner napkins. But I think these turned out really nice. Now, what didn't turn out so nice was a little experiment and I just posted that video this morning. It's CRAP number 17. CRAP stands for Creative Relaxation and Play where I experiment with some stuff. So I got out some of those uh, old white napkins you've heard me talk about before. <clears throat> frog in my throat. This is about the third week in a row that when I start my vlog I get a frog in my throat and I don't know why. <clears throat> Excuse me. So anyways as I was saying I, take, uh, I took all my old white napkins um, that I've been saving up uh, that are stained and I can't get stains out and I've been recycling them into napkins. And I've been using various products on that as you know. Um, so I, I saw a video and the video said uh, make your own fabric paint. And that by the way is one of my, I've jumped ahead a little bit, this is one of my inspiration lists. You can make your own fabric paint by using just acrylic paint and um, there's a medium you can buy called uh, textile medium. It's G GAC900 I think what's on the bottle. You'll find it in artist supplies like Golden or Liquitex. You mix it as a one-to-one -one ratio to your paint, mix it up well and you now have a um, fabric paint. So it's washable and that kind of thing. Now you have to heat set it which just basically means once it's dry, throw it in your dryer for half an hour or take a hot iron to it and press it. And you're not supposed to wash it for 72 hours or something like that. But it works fairly effectively and I have used it before. So I thought I'll get out a couple of these old napkins that I have and I'm gonna paint on them. And I'll use like some stencils and um, my jelly plates. And this was also part of one of my inspirations this week that I couldn't wait to try. So basically you mix up your fabric paint 
put it on your jelly plate and use your napkin, your material, just the same way as if you were doing a monoprint on paper. So I tried that and I tried a few other things on it and well you'll see the whole process. It truly is a crap video because they came out like crap and here's what the final product looked like. Okay I used red, gold and green paint and it's just a hot mess really and you see the little designs in there I got out my foam my art foamy stamps and I had one that sort of looked poinsettia-ish like it actually looks like a marijuana plant but uh, who can tell and uh, I put the gold acrylic paint on it that I'd mixed up textile paint and stamped on it and hoping that would do something and that didn't do a heck of a lot so I didn't quit I'd cut the old um, hem off of these and I went around with my serger. I just left in the, the red and the green thread that I had in the serger. And so this is what I got. Well, these are not Christmas napkins, okay? Um, but what they are now are paint rags. <clears throat> so, you know, I got a couple of nice paint rags uh, out of it all. And they're washable and they'll just get more color on them when they're done. So anyways, I have documented my whole fail there in the video and I've put the link below for that. Um, so you can watch that and have a laugh and um, also I'm hoping it, I, I left it because I do believe that as much as you want to show the successes, I think we can learn something from the failures as well. And I certainly did and you'll hear what things I learned in that video if you watch it. Um, but anyways, it's there for you to enjoy, have a laugh, don't do it. Okay, simple as that. The other thing that I bought is uh, uh, I got a gingerbread kit house. Now I think I will do a video as I put this together because I have never ever in my life built a gingerbread house. I have always wanted to, but I've never done it. Well, we were out grocery shopping the other day, and of course, they're getting out all their special things for Christmas, and there it was, a box uh, for build your own gingerbread, actually it's a gingerbread village, I think. I think there's about three little houses in it. Now, of course, these kits come with the gingerbread already cooked and baked, ready for assembly. And you use the, I guess you use, from what I could read on the back of the box, the icing that comes with it, to glue your pieces together and to decorate. And it's got little gumdrops in there and everything like that. It wasn't a very expensive kit. I think it was like $9 or something like that. So, you know, it's probably kind of juvenile, but then again, I'm kind of juvenile because I have never done one of these before. So Walter's laughing at me about this um, because I think he pretty much figures it's going to be a disaster. And it could be, could be a disaster. But as I said to him, well, I always have a glue gun no one's going to eat this thing, so, you know, worst comes to worst, if I run out of the, the, whatever it is, the icing, royal icing, I think they call it or something, I'll just use the glue gun to finish it off. Maybe I'll just spray paint them too. I don't know. So anyways, I think I'll document my whole little adventure with building a gingerbread house uh, for YouTube, and I'll post the video. I don't know when I'm going to get to it. I'm not going to start working on it yet. I, I don't feel that Christmassy yet. I'll wait till probably December at some point and put it together. I don't know how long the little suckers last anyways. I don't know if they'll start to, after a while, crumble or what, what will happen. But anyways, my first experience building a gingerbread house, if anything, it should be worth a laugh. Maybe, maybe I should get Walter to help me with that. I mean, you, people have been asking me to do a video with uh, Walter and I working on a craft together. Maybe that's one we should do. You know, we'll have a couple of glasses of wine. Eh, it might be fun. I'll, I'll broach the subject to Walter and see how he feels about it. I may get one of his classic, mm, if you want to. When I hear him say that, if you want to, or if he says, that's fine, I know he doesn't want to and it isn't fine. So anyways, okay, so those are the new things that I bought this week. And um, what's next? Just looking at my list here. YouTube channel of the week. This one was a YouTube channel that was suggested and I forget who suggested it. I'm um, sorry about that. Um, but take a look. This week's YouTube channel is called Caged Fish. 
the lady who runs this channel is very creative and she has a lot of tutorial style videos showing you how to do a lot of different things in collage making, in painting, in mixed media, and she has art challenges as well. Now I do find her videos on the long side because I think she does many of them as a live stream so they run over two hours long and I do find that at times they drag uh, a little bit uh, however they are very good in terms of giving you some inspiration for projects this uh, web or this YouTube channel was recommended to me by one of uh, my viewers so if you have any suggestions for YouTube channels you would like me to review as well please write them in the comments below and I've also linked this uh, YouTube channel in my comments below as well so that's called caged fish that's K A G E D F I S H so check it out Okay, so as I said, um, her videos are very long, but there's a lot of interesting ideas in there, and you can always speed search through them. You probably speed search through my stuff too, so that's fine. Whatever. I'll admit I do it to other people as well. Not often though. I feel like I'm cheating them out of their time if I do that. You know, they spend all this time on it. I should grin and bear it, but sometimes I can't. Anyways, so uh, down below there's a uh, Caged Fish's uh, link. To her YouTube is there. I've got my Christmas Mix Media canvas link. I've also got my um, crap number 17 making uh, those horrible looking Christmas napkins that are now going to become paint rigs. And of course our latest Stephen and Walter live which we did do if you missed it. We did do it on Sunday afternoon at four o'clock and I actually put up a little teaser. I did a live teaser a couple of hours before um, because I know a lot of you have clicked on the notification bell. So when a new video goes up on my site, you get a notification through your email. Now, I don't know if you're like me or not, but I have a tendency to um, have my emails on all day. And uh, it checks every five minutes for updates. It up refreshes every five minutes. So I get stuff pretty quick. And in fact, that's the chief way people communicate with me. Um, you're bound to get a hold of me and get a quicker reply if you send me an email uh, than any other form. Uh, so anyways, if you don't have the little bell clicked off, do click it if you're interested and you'll get it an email. And so I thought I would put out this a couple hours before that we were going to do it since there seems to be some confusion on my, my part as to when we're doing them. Um, but we're trying it on the Sunday afternoon at four o'clock and I think we will continue to try that. I personally prefer Friday night. Um, the reason is I'm in sort of a, it's Friday night, it's date night sort of thing, if you were straight and that's what you want to call it. Um, but you know, it's when Walter and I kind of review the week, uh, what we've been doing. And uh, believe it or not, since he's retired, um, he's here all the time, pretty much, unless he runs out to get something or I run out to a meeting or something like that. But for the most part, we're in the same house, but we're not on the same levels. His office is upstairs on the main level of the house. My craft room's downstairs in the basement, basically. Our basement is finished. And um, we'll spend hours in our respective spots without seeing or talking to each other. Um, and you know, I think that's a good idea because if you're with somebody 24-7, things get boring. I mean, and can be annoying. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to respect his space. Um, I mean, I've been retired for five years. I've been used to being home alone. Well, mind you, he has been working too for the last couple, last couple of years of his career. He was working most days from home, but he was working. So, you know, I, he'd go into his office, the door would be semi shut and I would respect his privacy because he was working. So, Right now he's upstairs and still in bed. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, 9.38 in the morning. Okay, that's his, one of his other hobbies, sleeping. Um, anyways, uh, what, where was I going with this? Jeez, um, oh, Friday nights. So, you know, in a sense, Friday nights are kind of fun. Um, 
because we open up the bottle of champagne and we sit there. We used to watch YouTube videos uh, a lot. Well, I did. He just put up with it. Um, and so I thought that would be a good time to do Stephen and Walter Live. But I know that, that that's a, an awkward time for a lot of people for a lot of reasons all across the world. I have to be mindful of other people's, you know, the time in their area. So it seemed that uh, there was several of you that voiced that you would rather see it on Sunday afternoon. So that's what we tried. So I am going to try to give you a couple of hours warning before we go on and I'll do that through a little live teaser. Um, and if you've hit the notification bell, as I've already said, you will know that it's coming up at what time. Okay. So anyways, the plan is this Sunday coming, which would be what? November the 19th um, at four o'clock Eastern Standard Time, our time. We'll be on again for Stephen and Walter live. And I am really enjoying, and Walter is too, and you can tell. If you watch back to some of our very first Stephen and Walter lives and look at the latest one, it's more Walter than Stephen, which I'm perfectly all right for because I have this time with you. Um, you know, and uh, he's really getting into it. So back to the gingerbread house, maybe I can get him into that. We'll see. Okay. So let's uh, move on. That's all the lists there. Okay, what's pissing me off this week? Not a heck of a lot. Just winter. Um, why does winter piss me off? Well, one, it pisses me off because I can't do anything about it. I live in the Northern Hemisphere. Winter happens, Out eventually. Um, it's gonna get cold. It's gonna get snowy. Snow creates work. You gotta shovel it. Well, in our case, snow blow it, but same diff, uh, really. Um, you have to drive in it. Hate that. Um, and it's cold and it's usually in our area, it's not only just cold, but it's also damp kind of a thing. A lot of moisture in the air. Um, you know, it's not Christmas card fluffy. That's what, that, that's what makes snow look wonderful. And you see it all on the specials at Christmas time on TV. And it's a light drifting of snow coming down. And everybody's in their little sleigh and all bundled up singing Christmas carols. And you hear jingle bells and you see horses and forest. And yeah, no, that's not what winter's like at all. And I think I've mentioned this before. We live in one of the warmer parts of the country. We're kind of the Florida of Canada. Well, sort of. It gets cold, but we don't get as much snow as even the, the, the states that touch onto the Great Lakes that are below us. They get more snow than we do because it has something to do with, um, they call it uh, lake effect snow. And it has to do with the way the winds blow, how much moisture is in the air that's picked up from the lakes and where it dumps it. And it usually dumps it on places like Buffalo, Rochester, Chicago, places like that. Um, so we get less. But if you just go north of us, not too far north, if you go north of us by about maybe 40 kilometers or so, they can be buried. We could have a, actually have bare spots or you could actually see grass um, where they would be covered in snow because there's something called the snow belt. And it happens to be just this area that all weather things are right and they get dumped on all the time and of course if you go out to the western provinces or to the eastern provinces they get so cold and so much snow in winnipeg we were there many 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 years ago like 30 probably and not in the winter but in their parking lots their public parking lots they will have plugins for their cars um this is basically something called a block heater which are keeps the engine even though the car is not turned on it keeps the engine warm so that you can start it because they get cold that goes down like minus 40 degrees celsius that's a good day and they get dumped on all the time with snow and right across the western provinces until you get to the other side of the rockies when you hit into vancouver in bc now my brother lives there and in february they can have start having like crocuses and flowers coming up um they don't see a lot of snow so they probably see less snow than we see here uh, where I live. So um, when I said that we're the Florida of Canada, maybe Vancouver is more like that. But again, it has to do with the effect of the ocean 
breezes, the currents and things like that, the mountains, where they're situated, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm not a, a weather person, so I really can't explain it. But anyways, so what pisses me off about winter? Well, the cold and the snow. And I just want to be someplace warm. Um, as a kid, I loved it. I loved winter. Um, you know, I go tobogganing. Of course, when I was a kid, I wasn't really responsible too much until I got older to shovel out the driveway. I hated doing that. And those were in the days before my family had a snow blower, so that was uh, literally a pain in the back. Um, and I, I loved it. And I always thought Christmas, you know, you had to have snow at Christmas. Now, there are many places in the world that do not have snow at Christmas, and I've been to some of those places. And I have to say, it is a little strange. The first time you go someplace that doesn't have snow for Christmas, like you go to Florida and you see palm trees and it's warm and there's people on the beach on Christmas Day, or in Australia, for that matter, um, it's a little strange for us that live in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, however, and, and snow is associated with Christmas. You know, it, it, it's pretty. I've often heard uh, people say, yeah, it would be nice to have a little snow, light snow on Christmas Eve and on Christmas morning, and then on Boxing Day, it can all melt and be gone and no more. And we have had many years where we've had green Christmases, where we haven't had any snow. And you know, that's kind of sad too, um, because everything looks dirty and dead. And it's not pretty. It's not pretty at all. But it's weather. You can't do anything about it. So I can be pissed off with the weather, but it's not going to do me any good about that. So what else pisses me off about winter? Well, let's talk about clothing. Okay, every time you want to go out to the store, if you're just going to run down to the corner to pick up a jug of milk or something or a bag of milk, our milk comes in bags here in this country, um, you have to bundle up. So, you know, you're already wearing your long pants, your woolly socks, your woolly underwear, you've got your long sleeve shirts on, and that's just indoors. Then you throw on the scarf and you get out the parka and then you throw on the gloves and then you throw on the snow boots. And by the time you're ready to go out, you've spent 10 minutes getting dressed to go out. Then you have to trudge out to your car. You gotta get, and your car is as cold as heck. Um, so a lot of people will do, but it's not good for the environment, is they'll get their car going before they go out into it, remote starters. I'm a little primitive. My car's a little old. I do not have a remote starter for my car. So I actually physically have to get into the car, start it up, and then you put on your heater full blast and you wait indoors for about five to 10 minutes until your car warms up. Actually, I don't wait. I just get in, turn it on and drive and put up with the, the cold and hope that the heater cuts in soon. Um, Walter's car has a nice feature. He has a newer car than mine and his has uh, seats that heat up and that is nice I can tell you and you can adjust it for you know which seat you're sitting in so the driver's side is independent from the passenger side and I really like that. That really keeps your bum warm I can tell you. That's a nice feature. Next new car I buy it's going to have that feature, I can tell you that. And I guess cars now come with uh, heated steering wheels as well. Mine doesn't have that. So, I don't like driving with my gloves on because, you know, gloves are thick. You can't feel the steering wheel as well. So you take your gloves off, you put your hands on the steering wheel, and it's as cold as ice. Don't lick it with your tongue, okay? It's going to stick. Um, of course, too, if there's been a snowstorm or an ice storm, you usually have to defrost your windows. And that means starting up your car, putting on your heater, the defrosting element. It blows hot, hot air, takes it a while to get hot though, up on the inside of your windshield. Meanwhile, you get out with your scraper and you're scraping through ice and snow. Well, of course, if you've just had a big dump of snow, you also have to brush it all off your car. Uh, as well. And what pisses me off about that are the people who don't brush their car off completely and they leave about this much snow on the roof of their car. Where do they think that's going to go? As soon as they pick up speed and it's always, I'm always behind these jerks, it starts to peel off and it blows all over you and makes visibility uh, poor. You know, people, be courteous. Brush off the whole damn car, including your roof. Take a few extra minutes. Really, it's a safety thing. 
And then, of course, you're scraping away all the windows and whatnot. Of course, by the time you've done that, the inside of your car is probably warmed up. Um, most cars have a rear window defro uh, defogger or defroster. So you hit that, it's little co electric coils that go through the glass and that melts the snow off of that, which, oh, I remember the days when I didn't have that in a car and that was just a pain in the butt. Because basically, if it, you had a really bad ice storm and trying to chip the ice away, you'd, you'd be chipping little portholes to look through. Not, not really the safest way, but you know, like it would take half an hour for your car to thaw out. So yeah, that's what pisses me off about winter with that. So by the time you get dressed, to go out into this weather by the time you get your car ready to go you've spent probably 20 minutes or longer just preparing to go out to get your stupid bag of milk makes you want to have a cow in your basement you know so you don't have to do that in the winter time and let's not forget about ice on your doorstep okay somebody gets seriously hurt coming to your door uh what happens is we can have ice storms which basically is what we call freezing rain Freezing rain when it's cold enough out that it's it's kind of a rain, but when it hits, it freezes and it coats everything. And you can have some very severe ice storms, and we have had to the point where they snap uh, hydro wires off, they snap tree branches off. It can be very devastating. And driving in something like that is you don't want to because you have no control of your car, no matter what. It's just so easy to swerve out of control. And your doorstep is covered in this stuff, so you have salt. Or you have something that's a non-salt substitute, a, a melter, an ice melter. And you throw this on the ice and it will eventually eat through the ice so you can scrape it off. Or if the sun does come out, eventually it, it'll heat it up enough and it'll melt the ice away. But it's a process and it takes a while. It also can really, if you use actual salt, um, it can really ruin your your pavement or your interlocking brick or whatever you've put on your front steps kind of thing. We know that from first hand. So anyways, that's another thing that pisses me off about all that. So then you get on the road, you're going off for that bag of milk and what happens? First snowfall, this is usually when it happens, first snowfall. It's like everybody has forgotten in this country how to drive in snow. So you've got wipeouts everywhere. They're spinning out, they're, they're crawling at, at a speed limit that you could walk faster or then you get the idiots who think yeah it's icy I should go faster it makes a lot of sense so sometimes you're white knuckled when you're driving and if it's snowing too your visibility decreases considerably and you're going through this now somebody in Australia a taxi driver was talking to us last time we were there and for some reason we were talking about snow and he he said well, you don't drive in that or anything. He said, yeah, we go to work in that. We go to school in that. We drive in it. We do what we always do. It takes us longer, but we do. He couldn't believe it. He says that if they got any snow, and this was in Sydney, he said on the rare occasion when he had seen snow or Sydney had snow in a little part or something, and I guess that's that would be extremely rare, um, he says everything shuts down. And all I can imagine is like one flake fell and it's like chicken little. Oh my God, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And everybody runs in their house and shuts the doors up tight as the apocalypse has come. I don't know. Those of you in Australia can tell me uh, what that's like. But anyways, so that pisses me off about snow, about winter, the whole bit. Bad drivers, having to get bundled up to go out in it, cleaning off your car, cleaning off your sidewalk, your driveway. Winter is not fun. Maybe I should have taken up skiing, at least I could make use of that. But I tried skiing many years ago and I'm not that coordinated. It was just ending up in disaster. So anyways, that's what's pissing me off this week. And yeah, so right now I'm going to insert in here um, a little video I made showing our first snowfall. So this is what the first snow in Canada looks like in our area. It's very early. This is Remembrance Day. I didn't even Day. get a chance to uh, clean the leaves off. Yeah, see, so Walters, they didn't even get a chance to clean the leaves off yet. And there's ice. This is ice. For those of you that don't know ice that I'm standing on, this shouldn't last. In fact, I'm surprised. This happened uh, two days ago? A day ago. A day ago. And uh, by all intents and purposes, this should be melted. Um, at this time of the year, but 
it isn't. So, anyways, that's what the first snow looks like. It's kind of pretty, but you get tired of it really sick, or really quickly. Okay, we're moving on now to technique tips and product reviews, and I've got some new things here to show you. Okay, so I did go to Michael's and I bought some of Jane Devonport's uh, paint over pens. Uh, I question why she calls them paint over pens. These are supposed to write on acrylic paint, so wouldn't it be pen over paint? I don't know. Anyways, I haven't taken them out of the package yet, as you can see. I'm a little disappointed in her color combination. She has two packs of these, and they're all pastels. Um, of course, mind you, that's her paint palette to start with, with her markers and her watercolors and everything anyway. So, I mean, it's keeping with her paint palette. But these colors, I don't know. I, the teal's kind of nice, but the other ones, not so sure. Although, there's two white ones in here, and that's really why I bought them was for the white ones, because I'm always looking for a white pen that'll write over top of acrylic. And I know the Uniball Signet white pen will do that, but I want to find something else as well. So, I'll let you know how those work. I haven't taken them out of the package yet. And um, that's about all that I bought new, and I used a coupon on those. Um, because they're about $15 a package, I think, or $12.99 or something, and I had a 40% off, so I used that. Now, I showed you last week the new Delusions rubber stamps that I got, and one set of them were called the Putty Cats, and these are the Putty Cats, but you'll notice they're all nicely fussy cut. Um, I didn't do that. I stamped them first and I used my Tim Holtz stamp, stamp platform so that I could get a good solid crisp image, scanned them into my computer, used the Cricut Maker to cut them out. And the beauty of the Cricut Maker right now is, oh there's another one I missed him, is that it will also, you can print on patterned paper, scrapbook paper, and it can still cut out the image so it doesn't have to be just on plain cardstock. So if you want to add a little patterning, now I, these are maybe not the best patterns, but um, I picked a couple of patterned papers, printed my cats out on those, and yep, the Cricut Maker uh, cut them out. So you know, if you feel a little lazy about coloring something in, um, you can always do it this way as well. And I've got some more. Uh, Delusions stamps I showed you last week that I haven't even taken out of the package yet and I'm going to do something similar with those as well and the whole idea is once you've got these little suckers into your into the Cricut Maker I can resize them to whatever size I want large small whatever and I can use them on journaling pages cards whatever so that was one thing and let's see anything else new nope not from that now I've already talked about one of my uh, the inspirations I got from YouTube and that was the whole disastrous make my own Christmas napkins but the technique there was printing on fabric creating your own fabric paint which I think if I had done things a little differently I might have made that work but for the first time and you'll see it on the crap video crap 17 um, you know what I did and wrong with that Another technique though that I thought was really cool is you take a picture, any picture. Now this works really great if you're doing this for like Christmas cards as you're going to see in a minute. I didn't have any really Christmas images. I just grabbed one from our last trip to London and we spent that one day in Paris. So I had this picture of the Eiffel Tower. And what you do is you put two-sided wide uh, sticky tape onto the actual picture. So instead of putting it on the back, you put it on the front. Two-sided because you want to stick to this and then you peel off the protective coating and so you have this sticky surface on here. Then you take a clear glitter, a clear fine glitter, sprinkle it all over, take your hand, rub it in so it's all sticking to that sticky side, um, and then take a little brush or something and just brush off the excess and you get this effect. See how it sparkles? It sort of um, dulls the picture down, 
but it's really kind of cool. It reminds me of those Christmas cards that have the like glitter all over them so that frosty snowy effect. So here you can compare. There's the original and this is the same picture except with the glitter. Now I didn't have any two-sided wide sticky tape but what I did was I have a Xyron. A Xyron is basically makes anything into a sticker and I had the large Xyron. So this would fit into that so I ran it through face down because the Xyron is not two-sided. One side is sticky, the other side is not. So I put it face down, so the sticky side, when I peeled it all off, was on the picture, and then I sprinkled in my um, glitter. So I thought that was kind of cool, something a little different, and your glitter does not come off. You rub it, that's why you rub it in with your hand. It pushes it in, and any excess that doesn't get pushed in, you just brush off, but it doesn't come off on your hand. So I thought that was a really neat technique. And as I said, if you had Christmas pictures or something with a Christmas theme, that would look really cool as a Christmas card. Okay, so those were the inspiration ideas for this week. What else to talk about? Events in the past week? Mm, it's a slow week. I took my mother to get her flu shop and do some shopping and we went out for lunch. So that's done with that. And coming up this week, I may or may not be teaching a class at OAA, Oshawa Arts Association. Nobody had signed up for the original date. We moved it ahead one week. Um, I don't think anybody will sign up for it uh, at all for a, a variety of reasons. Main reason I think is because it's not very well advertised. Uh, their communication, lines of communication, they're still working on those. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, I've been second thinking about teaching for that kind of organization because the people that belong to that organization are artists. Um, or at least they consider themselves serious artists. And, you know, I just don't know if this kind of thing would be appealing to people who are used to doing watercolor and acrylic paints and stuff like that. Um, also, sometimes, and geez, I, I wanna, don't want to sound really... Um, critical here but from my experience before working with people who are serious artists they tend to have a attitude to people like me who really aren't fine artists I still think I'm an artist I think any of us in the crafting world are artists but they consider us crafters and yes you know that's that bitter taste in their mouth and so they don't consider us you know serious creatives um, and I just figure that maybe I'll run into a problem you know um, I'm open to suggestions and I like people to do whatever they want to do when I teach a class because that's what art journaling is all about however I don't want to be put on the defensive and I don't want to be I don't want to feel inadequate and so I'm thinking am I setting myself up for something like that so anyways, I'm going to go in there later today or tomorrow. I'm going to see if anybody has signed up. And if they haven't, bang, it's canceled. It's over. I might make the effort to try and do it um, next year into the spring. Again, maybe things will be a little better. I don't know. But right now, I'm really kind of hoping nobody has signed up for the class. Sorry to say it, but that's the way I feel. Okay, so anyways, that's enough from me for now. Um, so Stephen and Walter live uh, this coming Sunday, November the 19th, around 4 o'clock. Uh, watch for it. And we'll see you then. And if we don't see you then, we'll see you next Monday. Bye-bye.